Okay, right on time and moving right along. I'm gonna. Do you want to be introduced? If you want to. I don't mind. <laughs> so, our next talk is uh, Torsten Berke. He's gonna talk about the near spec MOS. Thank you, Torsten. You may start. Indeed, I'm gonna talk about the near spec MOS. That's what it says on my title slide. Um, since this is the first near spec talk, um, I felt obliged to give you a bit more background. Um, so there's a lot of points on my outline here, um, but I only have one or two slides for each of those, so it should, should work okay. So I'm gonna start by giving you a quick overview of the optical and mechanical design, I guess it's customary. Um, I'll describe the, the layout of the, of the focal planes and notice the plural there, because Nierspec is the only instrument that has two focal planes, because we have the slit apertures, of course. So we need to introduce an additional focal plane. Um, I'll show you how that looks like, and then um, give you an example of, of, of what the MOS can, can do for you if you are, if you have accurate knowledge of where your targets are um, located with respect to each other. And I want to emphasize this um, because these shutters that we're going to talk about are very small, and so you need to have precise astrometry, um, precise knowledge of the astrometry to be able to position them in, in those shutters. Um, so of course, wavelength coverage, instrument configurations, that um, goes without saying. And then I'm gonna talk a little bit about the, the reality of the hardware of the MSA, the, this micro shutter array that we have. Um, quick word on data products and then um, how to plan the observations, but that will be covered in a dedicated talk as well. And then at the end, just for completeness, I give you sensitivities as well. Okay, so the optical design, um, many of you have seen this before many times. It's a pretty old schematic, but I think it covers um, very nicely the, the essentials. So basically we have three lenses, which in, realities, uh, in reality are um, systems of three mirrors, so-called um, three mirror anastigmats. You've seen that acronym, TMA, a couple of times. So the first one is the four optics. Let me just see if this happens, if this works. Um, the four optics system here, which simply images um, the telescope focal plane um, via a set of pick-off mirrors onto this intermediate focal plane here where all the slit apertures are located. There's a filter wheel here that defines the band pass. Um, and then a second system, um, the collimator TMA, um, simply creates a collimated beam that falls onto the grating wheel where all the dispersers are located. So there's a prism and, and a set of six uh, diffraction gratings. And then the dispersed light is uh, imaged by this last TMA, the camera, uh, onto the detector, and that's where the spectra are registered. Down here, you see how the PSF evolves along the path. Um, the telescope PSF is defined, of course, by the telescope aperture and the wavefront error of all those um, segments. Um, this is how it looks like in a simulation. Um, here at the micro shutter array, it pretty much looks the same. That's because our four optics is extremely good. It adds very little um, wavefront error. So it looks the same. And then, of course, it gets truncated by, by, the, by the slits or the, the shutters. And then um, diffraction effects kick in. Uh, you see the diffraction spikes here at the, at the pupil. Then when it hits the detector, things uh, look a little bit worse. Um, but that's OK, because we're not a camera. We are a spectrograph, so we are optimized for sensitivity. And if you sample that with our fairly large pixels, um, you get um, all the light in, in very few pixels, which is good for spectroscopy. Mechanically, this is how it looks like. I'm not gonna spend too much time on it. You can um, trace the, the three lenses. This is the second of the pick-off mirrors, and then the, the first TMA, here is one, two, three, is the four optics. Then we have a pretty clever um, refog mechanism that makes sure that the telescope focus is actually again focused on the micro shutters here. And then um, behind that, there's just a flat here and then there's one, two, three for the collimator, the grating wheel, and one, two, three for the camera. And here are the two detectors of near spec. Okay, so MOS, uh, multi-object spectroscopy. It's obviously the first MOS to fly in space and that has some pretty severe implications. For example, we can't just do mechanical slit masks that everybody else does. It would be hard to do that at L2. So we have to rely on a pretty novel technology, um, MEMS, which is microelectronical <coughs> mechanical systems, I think. And you see here this array of, of shutters that um, were developed at Goddard 
um, by NASA. Here's a blow up of one of them. You see the, um, basically these, these mechanical trap doors that um, open and close through these hinges. Then they are latched on the, on the back side. Uh, this shows in a bit more detail how that works. So the doors are covered with these magnetic stripes that react with a magnet that sweeps by. The magnet basically pulls them open against the torsion forces um, and then they are electrostatically latched just by applying a voltage to the backside of, of this um, egg crate structure, egg crates as we call them. And then um, they stay open until that voltage is removed and then they basically fall shut again. We, we don't let them slam shut, we do that in a controlled way by moving the magnet back down again so that it's accurately timed, so they, they, they basically close in a, in a somewhat controlled way, and that's to prevent mechanical damage. Um, there are light shields all around here to prevent light from leaking through, and I think that's all I wanted to say about that. Um, the implementation looks like this. This is the, the full hardware. You can see the, the magnet arm, uh, sorry, the, the motor of the magnet arm is protruding here. The magnet itself moves up and down uh, within this, this light shield here. A little bit of a blow up. You see that we have four quadrants um, of, of these shutters. Each has 171 by 365 of these shutters. So a total is about a quarter of a million that are individually addressable and can be open and closed. Um, between the quadrants, there is a mechanical, uh, sorry, a um, metal plate that has little holes in it for what we call the fixed slits. And there's a dedicated talk on those as well. They are permanently open and, and provide high contrast spectroscopy. And there's also a, a little square aperture here, which is our integral field unit. So this is the same view, just in a conceptual sketch. It shows the four quadrants, the, f the um, little slit apertures here, four on here and one for redundancy up here. This IFU is always blocked, and it's blocked by um, a metal flap. Um, when we're in MOS mode, it's always blocked, I should say. By moving the magnet arm a little bit down to the IFU position, this flap is um, retracted, and the IFU aperture becomes accessible. That's for IFU mode. But for this talk and for MOS, um, the IFU is always going to be closed. Um, I show this um, because it matches the photograph on the last slide, but from now on I want you to erase this view and think about it it's this way. Because only this way, you know, spectra go from left to right as they should, and therefore um, we're going to look at it um, in this orientation for, for the rest of the talk. And most in, in almost all documentation that you're going to see on websites, etc., it's oriented like this. So that's the, the aperture plane. And then I superpose it here with the detector plane. So the green areas here are the two um, near-spec detectors that capture the dispersed light. Um, two things to notice here. Um, so the, the fixed slits, they have their own dedicated detector area. Um, I want to, note, want to point out the gap between the detectors. So there's always some wavelengths that you lose. And the only way to recover those gaps is by moving the object, for example, from this slit to that slit, or from a shutter here to a shutter over there. And then you, know, you can recover those missing wavelengths if they are um, critically important for your science. Um, I also show here where the images of the virtual slices, or the virtual slits, or the, the slices of the IFU fall. But I said, you know, for MOS, um, you're never going to see these because this is closed. But for IFU, it's important to realize that they share the same detector area. So you can never do IFU and MOS at the same time. And in fact, um, you have to worry a little bit about leaks or open shutters in the, in the MSA. But Nora will talk about all of that tomorrow. Um, let me quickly walk you through an example for a science application here. So what this is, and, and Peter Jacobson might still recognize this because it's pretty old, this is a rendering of a deep galaxy field. I think it's actually a real field, probably the HUDF, um, the Hubble Ultra Deep Field. Um, so what I said is you need to know the um, relative astrometry of all these sources very accurately because then you can 
project them onto the grid of, of the micro shutter array. So this particular representation of the MSA is old. It's not the one that's flying. I'll show you that in a minute. But it still proves the point. And then, you know, I don't know if you can see all these red, red circles here. Those are the galaxies that you're interested in in this simulation. So the idea is to close the entire MSA and only leave open those little um, slitlets for the objects of interest. And I, if I blow up a little area around here, um, what you should see is that there's an object nicely centered in a so-called mini slit of three shutters. And I'm going to explain why we open three shutters in a minute as the default observing mode. Um, it's of course to enable uh, nodding up and down the slit so you um, enable accurate background subtraction. So I'm zooming out again and now I'm moving to the detector focal plane where all those objects are being dispersed if you put for example the low resolution prism in the, in the beam and you see now that um, each one of those is, is, an, is a nicely separated spectrum and the nicely separated comes because you've put some smarts into planning the the configuration beforehand. Um, so the, for, for the R100 mode, um, you get the entire near-infrared wavelength range between 0.7 and 5.3 microns in a single exposure. And because the resolution is so low, um, you can actually have fairly short spectra and you could even open more than one shutter uh, in, the, in the MSA row because you still have some space there. This changes when you go to higher spectral resolution. This is R1000 now. Same number of objects, but you see it's getting pretty crowded on the detector. Um, and here, because there are diffraction gratings, you can only observe a factor of two in wavelengths at the same time. Um, that's why we have bandpass filters in the filter wheel that limit um, the short wavelength cut on for the spectra so you're not confused by light that's affected to shorter in wavelengths. You also get zero order images here, very much the same as the, as the um, grisms and in, in near, nearest. Um, and we haven't really thought about whether they are useful for anything. Um, this is something we should probably consider. But for now, we just ignore them. And this, these are the spectra that, that, that are interesting. Um, same for the ultra high or oh, I'll try the, the R3000 mode. Spectra are even longer, and for many of the objects that are especially on, on the right-hand side of the MSA, you're going to lose some wavelengths here because we are running out of pixels on the detector. This is um, a summary of, of the um, spectral configurations of the instrument. So as I said, for, for the prism mode, um, you get the full spectral range in a single exposure. For the other two modes, you require three or four exposures to cover the full wavelength range. I say three or four because it, if you really want the short, the very blue end, you need a separate um, combination of bandpass filter and grating to get that end. Um, but with three exposures, you get everything between one and 5.3 microns. Um, and the only difference is that here that the me medium resolution gratings and for the higher resolution mode, you get the high resolution gratings here with an H. And those are the, the wavelength ranges that you get extracted by the pipeline for each of those configurations. Okay, so, so far the theory. Um, let me talk a little bit about the real MSA. Um, this is what it looks like. And before you, f you know, faint or <laughs> gag or whatever, um, let me point out that this is not a CCD camera, okay? Um, these things have to be closed almost all the time unless you want to open one or shutter. So it looks not so very nice. You have clouds of stuck shutters that, are not, that you cannot open because they're stuck in, in one way or another. You also have rows and columns that we mask out because they have developed optical shorts, uh, sorry, electrical shorts. Um, so uh, there's some problem in commanding um, with the MSA. But as I said, most of the time, all these shutters have to be closed anyway. Um, and you can still, there's plenty of shutters open left uh, for you to put your targets in. You lose a bit more when you consider the um, uh, field stop at the entrance aperture of near spec 
Um, there's a frame that makes sure that we don't get any unwanted light from outside the field of view, and it's a bit conservatively sized, so we lose a couple of shutters um, on either side. So failed closes are a nuisance, but they're not critical. What's more critical is actually failed open shutters. You probably can't see them here, so I've marked all of them. Those are 19 shutters that cannot be closed. That means they're permanently open, and it means that light gets permanently through. And that is a problem, of course, because even when you are commanding everything closed, you still get light on the detector. And bef again, before you gag, this is hugely exaggerated. <coughs> this is an extremely bright lamp that just demonstrates the effect. So you see these, these spectra that you don't really want. This is basically the empty sky or the zodi that gets through. You also see some um, diffuse background, which is just an illustration of the um, finite contrast of a shutter. The difference between open and closed is not infinite, so you get always a little bit of light, and because you have uh, 365, actually no, seven, 700 shutters across the two quadrants, the leakage through each of them adds up, and you see this, this, this diffuse background. Um, that needs to be taken into account. It's usually negligible for anything um, brighter than, than the very faintest galaxies that you're, that you're after, but it's, it's the Zodi, um, the, 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 the combined Zodi leakage from all those shutters that you need to subtract somehow, and I'll show you how we subtract that. So, okay, so this is all closed. If you, if you open, you know, good shutters, this is how it would look like. If you, if you blink, you can, you can see the difference between um, the, the desired spectra and the undesired spectra. Um, here we have just arbitrarily opened in a test exposure little um, sets of four shutters separated by a closed one. And you can imagine how, to, how you remove the, um, the leak light just by differencing them. We are a little bit smarter than that. And our default observing strategy is the following. We, as I said before, we open three um, shutters in, in a so-called mini slit. And we position the target in the first exposure in the top one, second exposure in the middle, third exposure in, at the bottom. And then you can difference the three exposures in various ways. Let's take the middle one where it's nicely centered. And you just subtract the average of the other two exposures. And what that will do for you is that it will, first of all, remove the underlying Zodi background in that shutter, but it will also remove most of the leakage and the failed closed, uh, sorry, failed open shutters that I showed you before, unless you're unlucky and something bright moved in when you did the small dithering. But if you're just worried about the, the Zodi light, that should be fairly smooth, and by doing this, you get rid of most of those effects. This is an, a simulated exposure that you have on your USB credit card that, that you got when you registered. Um, you can play with those exposures. This is basically um, an example for what I just described. The source is centered and we subtract the average of the other two exposures. I blow up the stretch a little bit. And now you see the negative traces on either side of the, of the central source. Otherwise, it looks pretty clean. Um, and you can, of course, extract that um, and get a nice spectra. The data products for each of the um, the spectra that you just saw, um, you cut out the region of interest, what we call the extraction window. Here you still just have pixels, and you see that there's some curvature. It looks a bit funny because there's, you know, what is that? A thousand uh, pixels, um, so we squeeze them together, and there's only 10 up and down, so they look very, very elongated, the pixels. When you rectify, um, this um, now by assigning um, a precise wavelength to each of the pixels and putting them on a common wavelength scale. This is what we call the rectified 2D spectrum. And here now wavelength is really nicely aligned uh, along the vertical axis. Um, you can then apply your favorite extraction algorithm and get a 1D spectrum by, by either collapsing or doing you know, some weighted um, addition. And you can see the absorption features here that, you know, the emission lines. And um, in principle, 
you can, you can either average these from the three pairs of differences that, that I described, or you can you know, first extract and average these. That's something that need, needs to be discussed, and, and we have to look into the pipeline a little bit, what is, what is actually the best way of doing it. That's still work in progress. So let me just say a few words on target acquisition and planning. Ten? Ha! I can speak very slow. <laughs> so um, target acquisition um, is challenging. And as I said before, you, it requires that you need very precisely the relative distances between your science targets, but also what we call the reference stars. These are brighter point sources in the field. Um, keep in mind that most of, of the near spec science will be very faint. So the, the targets of interest are not easily seen in a five minute exposure. Um, even if it's, un, um, even if it's uh, undispersed, sorry. And, and so we, we use brighter stars as reference targets and um, place those where they should be such that the targets of interest fall precisely into the shutters here. Um, that requires careful planning and um, there we have software tools for that. Diane will speak directly after me, give you a um, demonstration of how that works. But in general, um, what you, as I said, what you need to know is the um, astrometry ideally to within five milli arc seconds. That usually can only be achieved from either Hubble images or maybe near cam images once we fly. Um, if you have some other way of convincing yourself that, that you can either do with less um, accuracy and tolerate a little bit more um, photometric uncertainty because the placement of the, of the source in the shutter is less, less accurate and less well known. You can do with, with less, of course. Um, okay, and then once your proposal has been um, accepted and has been scheduled and you know a roll angle, you can go ahead and, and start optimizing the MSA configurations. Again, that will be covered by Diane. And then um, once all that is done, the pointing and the configuration files are the two critical elements. They will be linked to the um, visit files that you create through the use of APT and will be uplinked to the spacecraft and everything will happen autonomously without human intervention. And of course, um, if you have roll angle constraints, as you heard before, scheduling your observation will become more, more challenging. Okay, so. I, at the, I conclude just with, for reference, giving you um, plots of the MOS sensitivity. Um, this is a point source continuum flux in R1000 and R2700. Um, and I also have the surface brightness uh, sensitivity. Now it's in, you know, watts per square meter per hertz per arc second square both in, in, in the two modes. And I should emphasize that these curves are rather conservative, so you can take them as you know, lower limits for what you're gonna get. We're still revising um, the sensitivity model and also the ETC that you will be using um, will probably show you slightly better results once it's, once it's out. And that's really all I had, so I take questions.